thank you again for being a part of Color Vision's How She Got Here series. I'm super, super excited to talk to you today. So let's just like jump right into it. I want to know more about you and your background. So we can just start there. So obviously in my biased opinion, you grew up in the best state in the world, New York. <laughs> so yeah. how did that kind of make you who you are today? New York, namely Brooklyn, had a lot to do with who I am today. I'd like to say that me, me growing up in Brooklyn, namely Sumner Projects, it definitely taught me a lot. I feel like I wouldn't have the same grit and the same tenacity and the same, um, you know, can-do attitude if it wasn't for Brooklyn. Because if you've met anybody from Brooklyn, you know that we don't we don't take none. So we always try to make sure that if we don't have a way, we try to make one ourselves. And I feel like, especially looking at strong black women in my family like my mother who was a single mother my grandmother who was um who was a widow she my my grandmother and my mom had a lot to do with it too because they are the definition of brooklyn women to me they always do what they have to to take care of their families they're super loving super kind super intelligent but they're also really about their business so brooklyn had a lot to do with it and it had a lot to do with my my love for entertainment and music as well because as somebody who is a self-proclaimed um, eclectic music lover, I do tend to lean more towards the R&B and hip hop space. And obviously I couldn't say that I appreciate hip hop with, without you know, saying I love Jay-Z, without saying that I love um, Run DMC, without saying that I love all these different R&B and hip hop artists that originated from the East Coast, namely New York going to circle back a little bit um obviously we both grew up in new york and then we went to the atlanta university center mm -hmm. i went to illustrious clark atlanta but you know you went to spelman and i know how much cau has shaped me so how much has spelman shaped you into like who you are today and kind of made you become you <laughs> oh my god um geez in so many ways like i actually at first did not want to go to spelman and it's not anything on Spelman. It's just that I was the kid that always did opposite of what my parents wanted me to do. And I still am that kid. So my dad, since he went to Morehouse, he was always advocating for Spelman. So I was like, my dad only wants me to go to Spelman because he went to Morehouse. Like, what? Like, no, I'm not going to do that. Like, I wanted to go to an Ivy League school. I had this dream of going to Harvard and Yale. But eventually I was part of the Sean Carter Foundation, which is Jay-Z and his mother's foundation. Um, and we did an HBCU tour across the country. And we saw Lincoln University, we saw Morgan State, we saw all these incredible schools. And then last on the tour was obviously Spelman because we were going on an East Coast tour. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna see, you know, what my dad's talking about. I'm pretty sure it's gonna be nothing, but like, I, for some reason I had like this really crass idea of Spelman. I thought it was like uppity black women just like pointing their noses in the air and I wasn't gonna be happy. But when I went on Spelman's campus, it was my junior year of high school. So I was like 16. When I went on Spelman's campus, when I tell you, it was like an overwhelming sense of joy that came over me. Because obviously I grew up in Brooklyn, so I've seen I've seen black people, I've seen Hispanic people, I've grew, I've grown up in a very diverse melting pot, you know. But when you go down to Georgia, it's different. Like I can't I can't explain it. Like for anybody who is going to watch this and has been to Georgia, you know that sense of community that you just automatically feel when you're down there. And on that alone, I was sold. Like it wasn't just this type of black woman or that type of black woman. For me being just on that campus for a couple of hours, A, people were the nicest to me that I've ever experienced. Like the, the Southern hospitality was so real. And there were people that looked like me in so many different facets. Like there were tall black women, there were short black women, there were thick black women, there were skinny black women, black women with short hair, black women with long hair. And being from where I'm from, I, in the projects, see a certain type of black women. I didn't get to see black, besides my mom, my sister and my grandmother, I didn't see black women who could be more than what I saw in some of their projects. I saw black women going to class. I saw a black women with kids and still going to class. I saw a black women cooking. I saw a black women selling their businesses and, their, and being vendors. It was incredible. And I was absolutely sold on the idea 
And I will say that Spellman, if, if anything, Spellman has definitely taught me that being a black woman is such a one of a kind experience. And at the same time, it's also not a monolithic experience. A black woman and a black woman can be in the same room. And sometimes the only thing that they'll have in common is being a black woman because we're so multifaceted, you know? There can be a black woman like me who grew up in the projects and there can be a black woman who grew up in the suburbs. There can be a black woman that grew up in Delaware. There can be a black woman that grew up in Ghana. Like we're so multifaceted and we don't always have to be that, um, that token black woman in the room. We don't always have to feed into the stereotype of, oh, you can turn to me every time that there's something about black history month or hip hop history month. We're more than that. We're scientists, we're poets, we're artists, we're surgeons, we're cooks, we're journalists, we're everything that we want to be. And Spellman really taught me that there's more than one way to be Black in this world because we're not just the stereotypical Black that we see in some TVs and some movies where we're always popping gum and we're always doing this, that, and the third. And don't get me wrong, I am very true to my roots in the projects, I will always get a turkey bacon, egg and cheese. I don't say turkey bacon because I don't eat red meat. I will always get one of those from the bodega with a tall dollar Arizona. I will always be that girl. But at the same time, I don't always have to be this coveted painted experience of what a black woman is. And Spellman really taught me that. So I'm going to switch the tone a little bit because what attracted me to your you and your brand and your page was your social media um instagram all that so the content is what drew me to you so what with how prominent social media is in today's generation this world what tips do you have for someone who need for like a journalist who needs to up their social media game per se you know it's funny because people always tell me that my content looks good but in reality i honestly just go with what i feel like i I mentioned that I was a publicist before, so I was doing a lot of this stuff for other people. I was creating graphics for other people. And eventually I realized like, I'm doing all this for other people. Why aren't I doing the same for myself? And I looked back at my Instagram a couple months ago, like during the pandemic. And I realized that I was getting a lot of good feedback on my articles, but oftentimes people couldn't tell by my Instagram what I did because there were a lot of personal pictures of me, my boyfriend, my friends, my family, food, whatever. But I didn't showcase what I was doing. And not to say that there's anything boastful about it, but at first I was like, I don't want to show off my work. I don't want to be that person. But then I had to remind myself like, Deshonda, you do understand that you're doing all this work for a reason. And if you're recognized for it, then you must be doing something right. And I had to say to myself, self, myself said, hmm. she said, okay, let's do this. So I started creating these little graphics. Well, let me not say little because I don't like diminishing what I do, but I started making these graphics, just a basic backdrop of the person that I interviewed, a cool little snippet, and then like a carousel. And people went crazy for it. They're like, oh my God, these graphics are so cute. Oh, I love the fact that I can find your work on your page. So I would say that for anybody who wants to up their social media game in the world of journalism and media, if you're proud of your work, don't ever be afraid to share it. Like even if you don't want it to be on your feed, because I know some people are very, 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 very careful about their aesthetic on their feed. Even if you don't want to put it on your feed because you know you have something else coming up, don't be afraid to put it on your story. Don't be afraid to retweet it on Twitter. Don't be afraid to share it in a Facebook group. Be proud of your work. I'm not saying that you have to, you know, put out a banner or anything like that. But if you are as proud of your work as you say that you are, there is nothing wrong with sharing it. But also, there is nothing wrong with not sharing it. I know plenty of people whose page I can go to right now and I won't see a sliver of their work except in the link in their bio. And that's okay too. If you want to have a nice, um, what do I have? Link tree 
if you want to have a um, contact in bio, like there's so many different links that you can put in there to like showcase your work. And that's what I do instead of always constantly like pounding people with it on the feed, because that can be a lot. I would say just stay true to your aesthetic. If you want to compartmentalize it, you can just in the stories. If you want to just do highlights, you can do that. That's what I did. If you want to make cool graphics on Instagram and for Twitter, you can absolutely do that. But make sure that you're A, being consistent and you're B, and B, you're sticking to your own aesthetic. Don't compare yourself to other people on social media because that's a very, very, very quick way to like, you know, create your own downward spiral. But if you focus on you and what you like and what looks good to you, then your social media will take off before you know it. What would you say is your most rewarding piece and why? It would probably be a piece that I wrote at Essence for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And obviously that was a couple months ago. But I, when I first started writing three years ago, I started my own blog called Sign Shonda, you know, hence my Instagram handle. And the first piece that I wrote was an open stream of consciousness letter to my rapist. And when I tell you that piece went nuts, I, I, I didn't know that it would get as much traction as it, as it did. I put it in my newsletter. I got a few emails from people um, and I threw it in MailChimp and I sent it out like, okay, this is my first piece. And I had so many people calling me and texting me and DMing me and tweeting me. Like, like you would think that somebody was checking to see if, you know, I was still alive somewhere. Like there were just so many wellness checks and such an influx of support but I will give that piece a close second because the piece that I give first is the piece that I wrote a couple months ago at Essence and for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, shout out to, Char to Charlie Penn, who is the lifestyle director at Essence, absolutely beautiful soul. She gave me the opportunity to pen this follow-up letter to my rapist. And I was able to basically talk to myself as well and give a reflection period about how healing is not like a timely thing. Like you can't say, oh, I'll be fine in a year or I'll be fine in a month or I'll be fine in 10 years. Unfortunately, that's not how trauma works. If it does, maybe I'm doing it wrong, but that's, that's not how trauma and healing works. And that piece I will say was the most rewarding because in writing that piece, I was able to reflect on my growth as a person and read back where I was, where I was at that point in time when, you know, what happened to me happened to me when I wrote the letter and when I wrote the follow-up letter. So it was kind of like a chain of events and that that letter that I penned at Essence was definitely the most re rewarding, the most cathartic and the most releasing because I think as somebody that people know as like a celebrity interviewer, I try to be as authentic to my experience as possible. And I feel like sometimes I do, you know, get the label of the person that's always on or the person that's always talking to this cool person or the person that's always doing this. But at the end of the day, I'm a human as well. And I feel like what I did with that piece was I gave myself room to heal. I also gave myself room to grieve because I didn't know that I was still feeling all the feels that I was. And I allowed people to know more of who I am. And I was so touched by the response that I got from that essence opinion piece that I actually turned my original, um, my original sign Shonda piece into a monologue, which I put on my Instagram story. And then after that, I got such a great response. I was like overwhelmed with like tears. And I went on Instagram live and I spoke as though I was speaking to him and just, it was such a beautiful moment to me because I realized that I've grown so much in the past couple of years. And, 
you know, 21 year old Shonda, 23 year old Shonda would be so proud of 25 year old Shonda because I am acknowledging the fact that I hurt. I acknowledge the fact that I cry. I acknowledge the fact that I'm human. And it was, it was an amazing piece for me to do because I was able to not just let people know that I'm human, but let myself be reminded of that as well.